So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about the Garobi Compute Server. And here's our agenda for today. We're going to have a quick introduction. I really want to keep that as quick as possible because I think the best way to understand the Garobi Compute Server is to see it in action. So I've got a whole bunch of demonstrations planned for this presentation. And then once we've seen the demonstration, then we could talk more about how you would use it in, in practice, some of the special features, and some best practices and ways to uh, make it really, really shine and make it as useful as possible. So I thought long and hard, what's the best way and the, the simplest way to really understand what Garobi Compute Server is? And so as a background, what it is is a way to automatically solve models from remote computers. So you could build a model using any Garobi interface. You can build it interactively. You can build it in a C or C++ or Java program. You could do it on any platform. You could even use existing Garobi applications or third-party modeling tools like Ample or GAMS. Then once you've built the model, it allows you to solve it on a remote compute server. And that means that the computer where you're modeling it and the computer where it's actually solving are separate. And they're communicating via the network. It can either be a local area network or it could be across the internet. And the nice thing about it is that it works completely transparently. You don't have to make any changes to your code. It's just like any other Garobi program you would, you would write. All the magic happens behind the scenes and there's very little for you to manage. Now a lot of people say, well, th that sounds great, but how complicated is it? How difficult it is, is it? And so I'm going to show, show this to you in a couple of different ways. First, I'm going to show you what it's like to set up uh, servers. I'm going to show you two different kinds of servers, a cloud server and a local server. Then I'll show you what the client looks like, and then we'll talk about some of the uh, key features, running um, a model, queuing of, of multiple models, and what happens with failover, which is uh, when you've got multiple servers and one of the servers becomes unavailable. Now normally I would like to show you the local server first, but because it takes a few minutes for the cloud server to start, I'm going to start that first and then go ahead and while that's uh, booting, then I will go ahead and uh, start the local server. So how do I start a cloud server? I just go here to our documentation. I read in the cloud guide. I jump to the magic page where it says starting and stopping a cloud instance and I find the instance I want. So I want to start in Oregon and I'm going to start using the on-demand plan so I just simply click this link and this takes a moment just to wait for this page to load from Amazon Web Services and so I get the wizard here I say continue I want to select the instance type and so I want the high memory extra large instance type I'm going to supply some optional uh, data when I set up the uh, server. I want to say the job limit is going to equal to one. I don't have, this is really optional, but the reason I'm going to do this right now is that um, by setting a job limit of one, it'll be much easier for me to show uh, the queuing features of the compute server. That's completely optional. It's not required. I can just keep hitting continue. There's nothing here I have to do here. I'm going to select my firewall rule, and I'm going to select my private uh, firewall. Now the reason for that I'll talk about a little later, but the main reason is, is that I will be the only one that will be able to access this compute server. So don't get too clever if you think that you could uh, connect to this compute server because I've actually set up a firewall rule that will prevent anyone else from being able to access this compute server. So now I have to wait for that server to boot and this is going to take a few minutes. So I'll leave that in the background and while it boots, let's take a look at what it's involved to start a um, and install a local start and install a local compute server. So I switched to a different window on my computer, and what I've got here is a um, a virtual machine that's running Windows XP. Now, why Windows XP? Well, one of the questions we get is how difficult. How, what kind of systems do you need? to run the Garobi Compute Server? Do you have to buy special hardware? Do you have to buy a special operating system? And the answer is no. It will run on practically any computer you could imagine. Any computer that supports Garobi, that would be a Windows computer, a Mac, a Linux computer, any of these systems will support uh, the Garobi Compute Server. Even 
ancient, old, old-fashioned Windows XP. So I'm going to show you what that's like to uh, run it on a Windows XP machine. Now, if you've got a great server and you're running a server operating system like Windows Server or a Linux Server, it'll run great on those systems too. I just want to show you that you don't have to go get a complicated computer and you don't have to get a complicated operating system to run the Roby Compute Server. Now, the second question I get all the time is, boy, this must be difficult and this must be hard and, and time consuming to install. And I'm actually going to, sh I'm going to run a, a stopwatch. So I've got a little stopwatch application I'm going to run. This is a separate window on my computer. And I'll show you uh, that it really only takes a few minutes to install it. So I'm just going to start my stopwatch. So I'm going to leave that. I have to move that off the screen a little bit so that we've got more room to install it. So my stopwatch is running. And let's go ahead and install Gorobi Optimizer. Now the Gorobi Compute Server is just part of the Gorobi Optimizer. There's no special installer, no special package. So I just run this and do the usual steps that you would go to install the Gorobi Optimizer on Windows. So I'm installing it. And I wait while it installs the files in all the usual locations on my computer here. Let's just take a moment. While that happens, I'm going to open up a, um, a web browser, but I'm going to need that in a moment to get my license key. So I'll let that uh, open up while the installer still runs. Just take a few more seconds. We can see here we're uh, including my time spent describing things. We're up to a minute and 18 seconds, so not too bad. We're done with the installer. I'll say no to that dialog. Don't need that right now. Don't need this. Let me go to the Gorobi website and get my license key. So I go to download licenses. And I scroll down here to get my compute server license. And I run the program to get a license key. So I'm going to run that. It's contacting the key server. I'll just have it installed in the default location. Now my license key is installed, so I can test that. Don't need that window anymore. Let's just test. Okay, my license is working fine. Now I'm just running it locally, of course, on my Windows uh, machine, so that's fine. The license key is functioning correctly. Let me do one last thing. This is an optional step. I want to do the same thing I did on that Linux machine to set an optional uh, configuration file so I'll open this and create a file where I want to say job limit equals one. And I'm going to save this into the Groby directory where the software runs. Oops, that's not the right file. Let's try that again. GRB underscore CS, uh, the configuration file. And I save that file. And I'm almost done. There's only one more step left, which is I have to update the firewall rules. Why is that? Because if I don't, then no other computer will be allowed to connect to the Kurogi compute server. So let me add an exception to allow the uh, Gorobi Compute Server in my firewall. And there's two programs. So I'll add the worker and the Compute Server. And that's that. So last but not least, I've started the Compute Server. And it took all of about four minutes to install the compute server. Now, of course, let's see if it actually works. So I'm going to go to a different 
different window. This one is on my Mac. And normally if I run Garobi on my Mac, it's going to run locally. So you don't see any messages saying contacted a particular compute server. So that's running it locally on my Mac. Let me do something else to um, configure my system to use the compute server. Now I'm going to show you how I would do that. What I'm going to do, I will just show you, is that I've got a different license file. I've already written it. All I did was in this license file, I said compute server equals in the machine name, or you could specify the, um, the IP address. So I'm just going to say I'm going to set this equal to this um, compute server license file. And now, it works. How do I know it's running on the compute server? You should see a message here, server capacity available on Glockner 18 DBA8, that's the machine name of that XP machine, running now. So I could do anything I would want to, and it runs on that compute server. So for example, I could run a simple model, use an MPS file, And if I look at this, it says server capacity available on Glockner 18 DBA8 uh, running now. So this solves this model on this compute server, which happens to be running on my Windows XP machine. I could give it, of course, a more complicated model, like uh, MISC07, and let that run. And let's see what happens if I want to run two of these at a time. So. I'll just do a copy and paste. And now I'm going to run two of these at the same time. And you see in the second window, we're queuing because there wasn't capacity. It was waiting for that server to become available. Now why was that? Because when I configured the server, I set a job limit of one. I only wanted one job to run at a time. That's one of the features of it. We could set it for more jobs, but I wanted to set it just to one for demonstration, so that way you see what happens when one job is waiting. Well, of course, I can do more than this. I have, in fact, a second server, which should be ready now, and that's my cloud server. So I've started that, and here's my cloud server. Now, I have to get the configuration information for this, and this is the uh, machine information, which I get from Amazon Web Services. So let me go here and configure this license. And so I'm now going to specify two machines. My compute server equals two different things. They're separated by a comma. Here's my Windows XP machine. And here's my uh, remote server that's running on the, on the uh, cloud with Amazon Web Services. So let me change my uh, configuration now to use my cluster license. And I'll do that in both windows. And now I can run this and run this. And they both run at the same time because I have two different servers available, one running locally and one running remotely. So my lo you can see here in this uh, information here, this one ran locally, ran on Glockner 18. And this one ran on the cloud. So that way we had the two different servers running at the same time. Let me bring up one more window and let's do three, three models at a time. And what you're going to see now is two should run and one should queue. And so you see this third window, now that one was queuing and waiting for one of the servers to become available. So that's perfect. Everything is working as it should. Now again, it's not just for MPS files. I can use the interactive optimizer and I could take a model here in Python. So I could build the model. I'll just paste all that text in there and I can say optimize. And you see that this ran remotely on my 
uh, server that's running here, the XP server, and then I can get the values of the variables and print out the objective functions value. And then anything I would want to do interactively is running. It looks like it's interactive. It looks like it's running on my computer here, but in fact this was running on the compute server, namely that one. Uh, this one looks like it ran on my local machine. Um, if I started a second instance, I bet this one's going to run on the cloud, and I could do the same thing and run it on the cloud. And you can see it runs pretty fast, even though it's accessing the internet and doing all the calculations remotely. Now let's take a look at one last thing. Let's see what happens if a compute server becomes unavailable while things are running. So this may be a little tricky because these models run fairly quickly. I didn't want to take a model that was so difficult that takes too much time. So let's take a kind of medium-sized model. And let me just get ready with the command to stop the server. So I'm going to run three instances. I'll start one, two, and three. And I'm going to shut down my server. And let's see. So that one run, ran. So let's start up the server one more time. So let's take a slightly more difficult model. All right, we're going to take this model. So I've started my compute server, and I'm going to run it in three different instances. Start, start, and start. And now let's stop my compute server while something is running. And as it's running, you see here, solve interrupted. This server failed because we shut down the compute server in the middle. It was like simulating a network failure. And you can see here, this model didn't finish running. But the network still survived because this uh, client was waiting. And it just ran when the um, capacity became available on my remote cloud server. So uh, I'll explain a little bit more in some of the best practices of how to handle this type of uh, interruption. I simulated it here by manually stopping the server. But this is something you can do um, to be able to be robust. You've got the ability to have multiple servers. And when one becomes unavailable because uh, the server crashes or uh, some network problem, the other servers in the cluster still uh, do all the calculations and do all the computation. So you've seen this now running. Let's talk about what you really saw and how it would actually be used. So first, a few use cases. Like, these are not all the cases you would want to use for a compute server, but perhaps the most common ones. First, something we're going to call light clients. If you've got um, simple lightweight computers uh, that need to do optimization, and then you've got one powerful server or multiple powerful servers, you can offload the calculation of the optimization to the powerful server. We've got uh, customers that have asked, asked for this capability before Groby Compute Server was available. And they said, we've got these very old laptops. We're deploying them to many users across our company. These laptops are very slow. They're not very fast. And we've got many of them. Some of them are very old. So uh, how can we do the calculation in a way that the users get the results of the optimization on their laptops, but we could take advantage of the fact that we have some central servers that are much more powerful and much faster and much more memory. So you can use Groby Compute Server as a way to offload the optimization to a powerful server. A second use case is for a web application. Um, you could have a web server as a client for the optimization server. Now the users aren't really running Gorobi directly, they're interacting with a web page. You know, that might give them a way to input costs and to input demands and run different scenarios. They're really business users. And then they're interacting with a web page where they're creating optimization models. And that web page interacts with a database server, and it also interacts with the Gorobi compute server. So the users 
work with the web page. The web page itself, or the web server, is a client of the Gorobi Compute Server. And something that you saw in my demonstration, you can mix local servers and a cloud server. And this gives you a nice way to add cloud servers to manage the peak workload. Let's suppose you've got um, different kinds of planning and certain times of the year, maybe like around December, uh, you've got some very high peak load, uh, uh, workload because you've got, um, maybe you're doing business is very seasonal for the holidays. And so you might want to buy a certain amount of servers to manage your uh, need to do optimization planning for most of the year, but then for that time of the year when you've got a real peak amount, you could add additional servers just for that time uh, using those servers on the cloud. And that will allow you to only buy the servers you need for most of the year and then just pay uh, for these additional servers for the times that you need them. And that allows you to create a, clu a cluster. And that cluster has not just your local server, but can have one or more cloud servers. So a quick rundown of some of the many features of the Gorobi Compute Server. It's transparent. It supports all of the APIs. The communication is lightweight. It's cross-platform. It is robust. And you saw some of these things earlier. And I'll talk about these in more detail in just a moment. It's secure. It supports queuing. It allows you to do clustering of multiple compute servers. It's self-contained. You don't require any licenses on the client side. And uh, you can use your servers, the cloud, or both. So in fact, it's transparent. Your source code stays the same. The only thing you have to do is you make a one-line Gorobi LIC file, and you say what you want that server to run on. So you just write that own, your own Gorobi LIC file. You don't have to pay for it. There's no additional charge for that. Uh, you don't have to ask our permission to get it. You just write this, and that just tells your computer, uh, here's the server or set of servers where you want it to run. It supports all of our interfaces and all of the modeling you want to do. So if you're a MATLAB user, you're an R user, you like to program in Java, you can use the Gorobi Compute Server. If you already have a Gorobi application, maybe you run it with GAMS or with AMPL, or you've already built your Gorobi application uh, using an earlier version of Gorobi, just compile and link it and use the Gorobi Compute Server. Every single modeling feature in the Gorobi Optimizer is available to you. Model modification, warm starts, lazy updates, the IIS, parameter tuning, any feature that it pertains to modeling is available in the Gorobi Compute Server. The communication is very lightweight. It includes automatic data compression, so all the communication is very fast, even across a wide area network, meaning across the Internet. In addition, it supports incremental model changes. So if you've got a model and you want to modify that model by changing some of the coefficients, it's not sending the entire model across the network. It's only sending the changes. It's doing the smart and right thing. And here's just a simple benchmark. We ran a model uh, on, a, on a computer where we had the same computers, uh, you know, the exact same model and, and memory and, and configuration of the computer. So we took the same computer and ran it on a machine ran it on a local area network, um, and you could see the overhead was, was minuscule, was a, a less than a percent. And when you add the, the wide area network running across the internet, the, the added time was still fairly small, 5, 10, 11 percent. It's, it's pretty modest, which is what you would hope for. Uh, you don't want the overhead to be high. You want the solve time to be the hard thing. And the Garobi Compute Server does the right thing. Now, these are some simple benchmarks. Every case will be different. But what we've seen is that the overhead is low to use the Gorobi Compute Server. It's cross-platform, so if you're using any Gorobi uh, supported platform, uh, you can use the Gorobi Compute Server. In fact, you saw that in my demonstration. I had a Windows Compute Server. I have a Linux Compute Server. That's what the Gorobi Cloud runs on. And I was using my Mac as the client. And you can mix and match these as much as you want. The clients can be any supported platform. The server can be any supported platform or the cloud, and you mix and match them however you need to. Our protocol is very robust. It is a custom protocol, and we've developed it in a way that prevents you from having a, a zombie process. Now, a zombie process means you know, something that just keeps running. So if 
um, the client disappeared, the uh, worker on the um, server would recognize that, hey, that client disconnected, and it wouldn't keep on computing and wasting compute cycles. Each worker is also an independent process, so any problems with one worker won't uh, hurt or affect other workers on that server. There's a remote management tool that allows you to monitor and kill jobs. It also supports clustering, which I've mentioned before. It also supports security. We have built into the Garobi Compute Server the uh, standard 256-bit advanced encryption standard. Um, this is a, a, a published standard uh, that's uh, been adopted by the U.S. government um, as their standard for data encryption. It's a great um, method. A lot of different systems use it, not just ours. And you use an access password to prevent unauthorized use. I didn't use that because I had a local server and I used a firewall rule, which I'll talk about later. But this is a common technique you could use to prevent unauthorized use of the server. I used the network firewall rules, and uh, we'll talk about that in a few more minutes. Queuing, we saw that when the servers are at capacity, a, a client can optionally wait until a uh, server becomes available. When you have multiple servers, the client served by the first available. Servers um, recognize if a client quits, and you can also do some optional uh, management of um, priorities. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Queuing is completely optional. If you don't need queuing, you can turn off this feature. You just set the uh, you can set the job limit to be much larger. You can do clustering, and the clustering is nice because not only will it let you um, uh, help you with robustness, but it also helps you with load balancing. And you saw that uh, when one server was used, the job would be managed on the second server. Now, I had a job limit of just one, but you could have, I could have set a job limit of, of a higher amount. The default is two. You can set that to another limit um, when you're configuring a server. And the, job, the client job will run on the server with the lowest load. Uh, and as we saw in the demonstration, when a server becomes unavailable, any new client jobs will use any of the remaining servers. Now, it is tricky, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes. What do you do about an existing job? We uh, just treated that if there an existing job fails, it simply gives an error condition. Because resubmitting a job is application dependent, and you as a developer must determine how you want to manage that. So that's maybe the first kind of change you might want to make, because you have a new error condition that doesn't happen when you're running locally which is that your job failed because most likely the server was unavailable for network reasons. Um, clusters are dynamic. You can reconfigure them on the fly. You can add a server um, on the fly to your cluster. You can also gracefully shut down a server for maintenance. You know, computers need maintenance. You, know, you can say, you know, uh, a Windows machine frequently says, you know, please restart this machine to get the latest updates. And how do you manage that when you have um, working jobs, in fact, what you do is that you just set the job limit on the fly to zero, meaning you don't want to accept any future jobs. You let the existing jobs finish, and then once you've monitored that those jobs are finished, then you can shut down that server, do whatever maintenance you need to, and bring that server back up, and then you won't negatively impact any of the existing jobs on that server. The Garobi Compute Server is self-contained. It's a complete system. You don't have to add any additional tools. Everything you need comes with the Garobi Compute Server. There's nothing else to buy. There's no extra thing to configure, and you saw this. I didn't need to get a complicated server hardware, a complicated server operating system, complicated server tools. It ran on lowly old Windows XP. You know, this is the system that Microsoft is trying so hard to retire. That's officially, officially supposed to be retired in 2014. And in fact, it even runs on that, that it runs beautifully on newer systems. It will run great on Windows uh, Server 2008. It will run great on Windows 7. It runs wonderfully on a Mac. It runs beautifully on Linux. It doesn't need anything special. No client required. Uh, no client license is required. There are two options. The simple way is to set up a client license in your um, license file. But some people don't want that. They want to embed it in the actual application. And so there's an API for that. You don't have, this is optional. You can still use the older APIs, but if you want to uh, tell a client to run with a compute server, you can do that through the API. 
So I've talked about the features. Let's talk about some of the best practices, some of the ways to really um, take advantage of the Gorobi Compute Server. Um, some of these are performance considerations, and some of these are you know, ways to manage the load and manage access to it. So talk about bulk attribute access, access control, non-blocking execution, server discovery, reconnecting, failover for jobs in, prog in progress, and prog priorities and capacity. So let's talk about bulk attribute access. Now, when you write a Gorobi program and it's running locally, you don't really have to worry about the network communication. That's not an issue because all the communication is running on your own computer. And building a model is very efficient thanks to the lazy updates and data compression. But what about uh, when you're getting and setting individual attributes? Like you've solved the model and now you want to get the solution value for every variable. Well, that's not a big deal when you've got three or five variables. What if you've got three million variables? If you do each access, you want to get the X attribute on each of those variables, and if you did them one at a time, you're doing a separate communication between the client and the server each time. And if you're doing three million of those, that could be very slow, um, because each one is a separate communication. So in fact, what you should do is use group them together into one uh, get or set function. You don't have to do this. This is, a, this is optional. Your existing code will run, but it will run much more efficiently if you do them in bulk by using the, uh, the, the grouped attribute functions. So if I were in Python, I would use the get ATTR function instead of getting the individual X attribute on each um, decision variable on each var object. I want to get the X attribute on the entire model or on a, on a um, subset of variables rather than looping on each variable and calling the get attribute on each variable. It's not incorrect to, to loop over it, but it will be much, much slower, especially if you're communicating across the internet. So if you need to do things in bulk, you should use the bulk access. We've already gotten some questions from some of our new users about this. And uh, once we told them about this, they were much, they were very satisfied. They said, ah, now the Gorobi Compute Server is very, very fast. This is an important performance consideration in writing your programs. Um, one other thing to keep in mind, remember I said a, a few moments ago, uh, this is the kind of pro tip. Um, the Gorobi Compute Server uses data compression, and when you are getting them in bulk, it's really doing a much better job of that compression because it's compressing that in one large block. If you're doing it one at a time, there's not much opportunity for that data compression. So that's part of the reason why it's much better to do it in bulk, to get your attributes and set them in one big chunk rather than doing them one at a time. Second is access control. Now I didn't demonstrate this because it's a little easier for me not to do this, but in fact there's an optional password that you, you should use in most cases uh, when you're setting up a Gorobi Compute Server. This is it's not supposed to be a complicated system, it's supposed to be a very simple system. It's a, a shared secret password that you use and it's it's not really that important if you're working on a local area network, but it is something you should uh, consider the minute you're, you're going to use a Gorobi Compute Server across a wide area network, like the Internet. When you use the access control password, that also enables the uh, encryption algorithm. Now, of course, like anything else, it's only uh, if you're talking about security, we've got this great 256-bit encryption algorithm, but it's only as good as your password. If you make your password um, secret, you know, the word S-E-C-R-E-T, chances are somebody might guess that password. So you want to have a good password, uh, just like anything else on any other computer system. Uh, because if, you, if somebody could figure out your password, um, they might be able to decrypt the data. Um, in addition, uh, you should also consider firewall rules. Um, if you're, again, if you're running on your local area network, not so useful. I had to set up the firewall on Windows because without that, the default Windows firewall would have blocked um, the Gorobi Compute Server. But it is something I use on the cloud because I didn't want um, people that are watching my demonstration today to be able to access my cloud server. So I used a firewall rule that only allowed my computer at my uh, internet address to access that server. So this is two different layers of of, secure, of access control security. One is the password, which is also for the, the encryption, and the second is the firewall rule. Even though I had no password because I had a firewall, nobody could have uh, accessed my server. But 
because I didn't use a password, it meant my data was uh, much less uh, secure. So in, in most uh, applications, you, you want if you're using a uh, remote compute server on the internet, um, you want to use both a firewall and a password. Now, non-blocking execution is kind of a neat feature. Um, people have asked, well, if you're running remotely, why don't you say um, let the, the server run and bring the control back to my program so I'm not sitting there waiting for that server to run. So we have an optional mode called non-blocking. If you set non-blocking equal to run, then the optimization will run in the background. Now, of course, you could have done this yourself by writing separate processes or writing separate threads, but that's more complicated. By doing non-blocking, the control when on a remote compute server call will come immediately back to your program so you can come back and do whatever you want. Of course, this changes the, um, the execution a little bit because now, normally, you, you wait in your program for the call to the optimized function to finish, and you know when that's finished, then something's happened, like the model was uh, optimal, or it hit a time limit, or maybe it was infeasible, and you just check that status. Well, now you have to check an additional status, which is, is it finished? And so you have to check that status because the, the uh, control came back to your program immediately. So I've got a simple example of that. Um, this isn't part of the, the product. This is just an example of something you might want to do, which is to do a distributed concurrent solver. What does that mean? Sometimes people say, well, you know what? Um, my model has so much um, um, variability in it that um, sometimes on one computer it solves very fast and sometimes on another computer with the very same model and the very same data and the very same parameters it might run much slower. So we say, okay, why don't you try the different seed parameter? And what's that? That's a way in Gorobi MIP to try different uh, ways of breaking ties and that way when there's a little luck involved in a hard MIP, it will reduce, it, it'll give you a different way of, of uh, traversing through the MIP tree and um, hopefully finding, a better, finding that solution. Well, this is an interesting idea with the compute server because if you have multiple compute servers, you could run multiple strategies at the same time. And so, in fact, what you'd like to do is do that with non-blocking. Here I'm taking my model. I'm now going to run it in a non-blocking mode. So I've got a, a, a number of servers. I'm going to create an environment for each of my servers. I'm going to run it non-blocking. I'm going to read my model from an MPS file, and then I'm just going to go ahead and solve it. And that way the control comes right back to my program, and then later in my program I would have to check to make sure uh, that those programs have uh, finished. And of course, once the first one finishes, I could tell the other ones, hey, you know, I could just stop that environment. Um, and that would cause that program to terminate immediately because I got my solution back. Now second, this is a question people ask us all the time. How do I discover when a new server is available? And uh, we didn't build a tool for this. and th That was intentional. It wasn't an oversight on our part because we wanted all of the Garobi compute servers to be completely independent. The reason for this is we wanted no single point of failure. The minute you have an additional program that's kind of the watchdog or monitor that's looking at all the different servers, then that becomes the single point of failure. And we designed our, our Garobi Compute Server to have no one point of failure. We want it to be absolutely as robust as possible. So that does present a problem, which is how do you know when there's an additional server available? How do you communicate that? Well, we don't provide a tool, but we can certainly recommend a bunch of different processes. Um, you could create a file on your LAN, which would be essentially the garobi.lic file that the clients would use, and that's just something that you would share. And so that way when you start a new process, you bring up that file from your local area network, and it knows whatever the, the latest list of servers. So when you add a server, you modify that file, when you have to take a server down for maintenance, um, it is a good idea to update that file because then the, the clients aren't waiting to, t to test whether or not that's to test a server that's not available. Um, you could also publish that through a web service. You could make a, a web service API with query. You could also use messaging tools and messaging protocols across your network. Any sort of a tool that you would do for communication um, of um, you know smoke signals. <laughs> you know, put up something on the bulletin board, a piece of paper, any way you want to communicate that. That's how you would let it know. But we didn't provide a tool because we didn't want to have a single watchdog tool 
that would be um, a single point of failure, and then everything would be dependent on that. We want you to figure out what that works best for you and um, use a standard tool out there. So let's talk about reconnecting. This is a complicated situation, and he, let's, let me motivate it. Here's a scenario. We want, what happens when you send a, a model to the server, and then you want to shut down the client computer? People ask about this. You know, I've got a model that takes a long time. It might take hours to run. And let's say I want to run it at the end of the day when it started at 4 or 5 o'clock, and I know it's going to take a number of hours, so I want to start it. I leave, my, my uh, user leaves for the day, and then comes back tomorrow morning to go get that result. So you then, you know, you want to turn back on the client computer and get the solution values, because you know it's, going to, it's a hard model. It might take 4, 6, 8, 10 hours to run. Well, there's a problem with that. How do you restore the state of the client program? You know, the client program is what has the, the decision variables and the constraints. And it can be very complicated because what if you're doing something that's uh, solving a sequence of models, like a decomposition method. And when you've got a model that's the result of solving previous models, how do you get that, that resulting model that might be the one that might be very difficult? And of course, you want to prevent a zombie. So you've got these zombie processes, and we want to avoid these. We never want to have this runaway process that gets stuck. You never want to have that uh, somebody submits 10 jobs, and they're each one running for 10 hours, and they just bring your server to a halt because you've got these dead jobs because they disconnected, and they did it by accident. And so how do you prevent from having these zombie processes that uh, are living on even though they're supposed to be dead? Um, as, which is a complicated thing because you could have a legitimate case where you want to shut down the client computer and come back the next day, and that's not a zombie. But at the same point, we want to have the system be robust and prevent zombies when, when, when people you know, accidentally disconnect and can't reconnect. And so how do we recommend this? This is a, another best practice. We recommend that you build the disconnecting into the business application and use something that's called a three-tier architecture. You would have a client program, your application server, and your optimization server. Again, think back to web pages. Your client is your browser, you know, Firefox or Chrome or Internet Explorer. The application server is the web server, which is running on another computer. And then you have another server, which is your optimization server. And, you know, thinking again about a website, you can have a website where the web server keeps on running even though you've shut down your smartphone or you've shut down your laptop, and that web server still runs. And so your client will disconnect from the application server, but the application server maintains the connection to the optimization server. So that application server could just be a web server. It's the thing that builds up the optimization model. It builds up the decision variables, the constraints. It tells the uh, Garobi compute server to solve that. And then when the results come back, it comes back to the application server. So the user is creating the scenario. It says, I'm trying to solve the June scenario, and puts in the cost and, and the capacity data, and puts all that in there. And then the user, of course, shuts down his or her laptop, goes home for the day, and comes back the next day and reopens it. And they're not reading the optimization model. They're reading the business data back in. Another scenario, what do you do about failover for a job in progress? Uh, what happens if an assigned server fails or the network connection breaks that job is not resubmitted automatically. Now, we didn't build that in there. Again, the reasons are complicated, but they're very similar to the same state issues we just talked about a moment ago as reconnecting. So how do you re redo that state? So this comes back to your code. If you're concerned that, network, um, that the network could be unreliable, then you should uh, modify your code slightly to test for the network error, and if that happens, you should rerun your program. Maybe not rerun the whole program, but put a loop around your program, and the, the, the logic will rerun and resubmit the model so that it will get submitted to the next server if that becomes necessary, if this network termination problem, um, the network uh, communication problem becomes, a, uh, 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 ra becomes raised in your application. Last couple of topics, let's talk about capacity and priorities. You set the server to capacity to limit the concurrent jobs. 
Now, in my demonstration at the very beginning of our presentation today, I set the server capacity to one of both my local and my cloud compute servers. But you can also set job priorities, and this helps you manage the position in the Gorobi job queue. Now, if the capacity is available, any job will run. But when that job, uh, when that server becomes uh, saturated by setting a priority, that job becomes a much higher priority in the queue. Um, you do this in the client license file or when you create the environment in your program. You can also set a priority equal to 100, which means never queue, must run this job immediately. You can also set a timeout, which you would set to zero, which would allow you to reject rather than queuing. And what that means is that, you know, sometimes your job is so low, low priority that if, the, if there's no capacity, you just say, I'll run this some other time, rather than sitting there and waiting. So you can use these two different controls. You can set the priorities, actually three, you set the, the server limit but, uh, in terms of the jobs. You set the job priorities and the timeout to determine do you want to wait and what's the priority of that job. Now this is a collaborative system. We're not going to be the police of this. You as the application developer decide how you want to use the capacities and priorities in your application. So you as a developer decide how you want to use this. Um, we're not going to police that. We just provide a tool and you decide how you want to use it. Here's an example. And this is one that a couple of customers have told us they need to do, which is we have an important model that we must solve immediately, and then we've got some other models that we'd like to solve when the server's idle. They're you know, sort of longer term planning models and they're not urgent, and so when there's server capacity we'd like to run those. But then we've got some really urgent um, uh, scheduling models, maybe like real time, that we must run as, so, uh, as soon as they're ready. And so here's our recommended method for this. You set the server capacity to one, which would mean that just at most one job would run, and then the important model has priority 100. So that means that the important model or models will always be solved regardless of the server capacity. The other models will have the default priority so that these lower priority models will only solve at most one at a time. And if you still get too much load, you, know, you could still have 10 important models all trying to solve at once. The compute server isn't going isn't to help you with that. That's still a, a, a problem. You know, that if that starts to, to slow your server down too much, you may need more servers, in which case uh, add more servers, maybe cloud servers. You can also do some limits on threads so that each um, process might take less, um, less processing time and less power processing power. But you know, if you've got a large amount, there's no magic here. If you've got a large demand for the server and you've only got a small amount of capacity, you're going to hit, you know, things are going to slow down. There's, there is no magic there and you're going to have to uh, uh, either do other limitations on the um, on the number of jobs or you know uh, buy more servers. So that's it for my prepared presentation. I just have one last tip, which is that we've got some resources on our website for how to get started with the Gorobi Compute Server. Um, to install the Gorobi Compute Server, you go to the Gorobi Quick Start Guide. I'll show you this in my web browser. If I go to our documentation on the Gorobi website, in the Quick Start Guide, there is a section just on how to set up a Gorobi Compute Server, and it tells you both how to set it up and, and specific instructions for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Um, for the more complex server setup and administration, we have an entire section of the reference manual devoted to the Gorobi Compute Server. So if I go back to our documentation, I go to the reference manual towards the bottom of this. I'll scroll to the bottom. There's an entire section on the Gorobi Compute Server. It talks about all the elements, you know, how to set it up, do the administration, and how you use it. Um, how you do some additional, some of the development tool uh, tips I've given you today are there. And finally, if you want to use the cloud, there's a separate guide just to be able to um, access, administer the cloud. Uh, and that's also on the Gorobi, um, the Gorobi website. So that's it for my presentation. We're going to now turn it over and answer any questions that you might have uh, about the Gorobi Compute Server. Thanks, Greg. Our uh, first question comes from Andrew, and uh, he asks, is it possible to have both a client and server running on my laptop? Um, and this would be for testing purposes, say, as a developer. And uh, do I need a special license for this? 
Ah, two good, two good questions. They're, they are different. So um, I'll answer the license question first. Yes, Gurobi Compute Server does require a different license than an ordinary Gurobi license. So, um, for instance, if you have a free trial or free academic license from the Gurobi website, um, it does not include the Gurobi Compute Server um, capability. So if you do want the Gurobi Compute Server um, for testing or you, or you need it, uh, you want to purchase that, you do need to contact your Gurobi sales representative to get a license key for that. Um, the Gurobi Cloud does include the Compute Server capability, so there is no special version of the cloud to do to use. But yes, this is um, a different license key is, is required than um, what you might have been using previously. Um, now, if you want to run, can you run a client and a server on the same machine? Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly fine for demonstration or for uh, testing. You know, say if you're on an airplane and you're doing some development, um, and you don't have internet access in that boy, that would be very, even when you do, I have used the in-flight internet access, and not only is it expensive, but it's not very fast, and, uh, and, and it's definitely not uh, continuous, you know, the, the, you get into certain parts of the world, and, and, you know, you might lose it for a half hour or an hour completely, so uh, you definitely would want to have a, uh, uh, the compute server and the client both running on your machine, and that's, yeah, that's definitely something you can do um, uh, run running there. I could probably demonstrate that, but it would take me a few minutes to set up the right um, file to do it, but I, I'm sure I could do that. Um, if you want to stick around to the end, I can show you what that looks like. So I hope I've answered that. Um, do we have uh, more questions? Thanks, Greg. Yeah, we have a question from David. Um, he had a question uh, regarding sort of a clarification. Uh, in your uh, examples that you showed, you were submitting MPS files for solving. Um, how do you submit a model that you've defined uh, in, say, uh, C-sharp um, through the compute server? Ah, good point. So, in fact, you don't, if you've got a C-sharp program that's written today, you don't have to change that program. That program runs, and it runs beautifully with the Gurobi compute server. The only thing you have to do is you have to compile and link with the 5.5.0 libraries. So, if you wrote that with an older version of it, and you were running with the older version of the libraries, you do have to compile and link with the latest versions of the libraries. And that's true for all APIs. So I can show you a little example of that. Let's see here. I'm going to bring a window here. And let's see. I'll do Python because it will be easy. Uh, nothing to compile there. I'll do Python. Uh, And let's do the diet model, and I'll solve it. And there we go. It's solved. And in fact, it said server capacity running, and that one ran on the cloud. So it's a server capacity running on the cloud, and it solved my diet model on the cloud. And um, our diet example solves two models. It first solves a normal model, and then it over-constrains it and makes it infeasible. So it, solves a mod it modifies the model and solves the modified model as well. So I did that in Python. I probably could do Java, although I, uh, let's see. Let's see, I could do the diet. Oops, I have to compile it. So let's run that. So I'm going to compile that and then do Java diet. I should do that same Java diet example. And there I did it. I just compiled and did it in Java. Same example, same way. Ran on the um, on the cloud server. It's probably because I shut down the local server. Turn back on my local server. It run a little faster because it's testing for that local server. And there we go. So the little delay you saw was because it was testing both servers and it found out that the local server had shut down. But it had to wait a few moments to to find that out. And for such a simple model, that became a uh, it became a, a, an amount of time. So you see, I didn't have to change anything in my Java program. I took the same um, diet example in Java and the same diet example in Python. I compiled the Java one there and ran it, and it ran um, perfectly as a uh, compute server example. And again, you look here at my output, and it says server capacity. This time it ran on my local server, but the one before that, it ran on the cloud server. So I hope that answers that. So your existing C Sharp program, compile and link it. Nothing else has to be done. You don't have to use MPS files. In fact, 
we don't expect most people to use MPS files. We expect most people to use interfaces like the, uh, the .NET interface from C Sharp. More questions? Thanks, Greg. Actually, that looks like all the general questions we have at the moment. Oh, looks like we got one in. more. Yes, this is from Leon. He asks, is it possible to prioritize servers to prefer one over another when multiple are available? Oh, good question. Um, so the, uh, there is some internal work that goes on that looks at load balancing. So, um, so let's say I've got two servers and one is running, and, and let's say they both have you know, capacity two, and one's running one job and one's running no jobs that second job will run on the empty server. So it does its own load balancing. When there is a tie, I believe it goes in the order that you specified. I'd have to double check that with the developers, but I'm about 95% sure it goes in the order that you specify them. So let's say you've got one server that's faster than another. You put that one first in your list, and that one will, when, when everything is idle, it will run on the faster server first. But of course, fast is relative, because once that server is busy, it might not be so fast as this other one that might be a slower server, but it might be faster because it's idle as opposed to this one as server number one, which already is using some of its processing power to solve a, a different model. So it is a complicated question, but the internal system does the load balancing automatically, and I believe that then when there's a tie, it's, it's broken in the order that you specify them. And I hope I've answered that question. Thanks, Greg. I think that's all of our general questions. All right, great. Well, thanks very much, everybody, for uh, taking your time today to join us.